Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's pod, your suspicions were correct. A bunch of cold medicine is doing absolutely nothing to help your stuffy nose. Then we had our first look at the new iPhone 15 yesterday. And I'll say it, it looks like Apple still has its fastball. It's Wednesday, September 13th. Let's ride. Toby, I read this heartwarming story about life imitating art to an eerie degree. So in 1994, this baseball movie came out called Little Big League. And in it, the actress Ashley Crow plays the mother of a 12-year-old boy who happens to become the owner and manager of the Minnesota Twins. Fast forward to 2023, and Crow is the real-life mother of a major leaguer. Her son, Pete Crow Armstrong, was just called up from AAA to play outfield for the Chicago Cubs. And he could actually be nasty. He's the the number one prospect for the Cubs farm system. Two famous examples immediately came to mind when I heard this story. One was Brad Pitt injured his Achilles tendon while playing the Greek warrior Achilles in the movie Troy, which is just peak life imitating art. And then two, which is a little more controversial, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie struck up a romance while playing the romantically involved couple, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So something about Brad Pitt, man, he loves imitating art in his life. I want to start today's show by talking about the Apple event that happened yesterday. September is usually the time of year that the biggest company in the world unveils their new iPhones, and we got the goods this year. The big news, you're gonna need a different charger. The iPhone 15 and all future iPhones will now use the USB-C charging port. That sound you hear in the background is probably Neil laughing to himself because virtually every other smartphone, including his Google Pixel, has already been on this charging standard. The change comes in advance of the EU mandating that most consumer electronics be USB-C compatible by 2024, so it wasn't exactly a surprise that Apple made the switch. Other features that got people talking were a snazzy new camera that uses machine learning that can determine when a person is in the frame and automatically switch to portrait mode. But the best part is it also recognizes pets, which is going to be really bad for the quality of our IG feeds, but great for pet lovers. I'm going to have to look at so many pictures of people's pets, aren't I? Exactly. Overall, Neil, there weren't too, too many iPhone 15 surprises, (laughs) which could be a good or bad thing depending on how you look at Apple's current position in the global smartphone market. It's uh, also I want to point out the price to, did not increase. So there's the iPhone 15 base model, which starts at seven ninety nine, and then the iPhone 15 Pro goes for nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and that's the kind of the same pricing model as last year. So uh, you had the Apple bulls uh, all over Twitter yesterday, being like they added all of these cool features, uh, and the fact that in this very inflationary environment they didn't hike prices. Consumers should be pretty happy with them. It's a big win. Other features to note, they released a titanium iPhone, which just has a really cool looking finish on the edge. I genuinely thought that was cool looking, just like softer edges, a kind of yeah. polished titanium. Also, the the 15 ditched the mute button on the side of the phone for a more all-purpose button called the action button that you can code to do different things. There's also the 15 Pro comes with 3D video capabilities that will be uh, available at the end of the year. And then, yes, the price point was obviously a, a big win as well. So again, whenever we get an iPhone event, they're not going to change. The joke is always all they do is change the camera and release the same phone. But at this point, it is just incremental upgrades to an already great phone. So I think overall, people were generally happy with what they saw out of it. Yeah, Apple. 94% of iPhone users say they will buy another iPhone. It's just an inc- it. It, like over 15, over 15 different versions. They've, they've maintained a very high quality of product, but let's go talk about this charger thing because Apple has been using the USB-C in the laptops we're using. We're using MacBooks and in iPads for years now. Uh, and they were kind of strong armed into doing it, uh, for their iPhones. I think the last char- big charging cable uh, change they made was in 2012 with when they switched this massive 30 pin I think it was called something dock it was the dock connector and they changed it to this lightning cable and that caused all sorts of uh, criticisms and hand wringing and you know I think it's because it wasn't expected and the fact that we know this is expected every and USB-C's are more prevalent around the world this isn't such a big change i mean do you have any i mean you're now you're going to be able to use the same charger with your your computer with your phone it's super simple which is going to be really nice yeah it is totally different this time around because again 90% of the smartphone market other than apple 
is using USB-C. That is not an exact statistic. I'm just saying that the majority of the smartphone market actually does use this charging standard already. And the EU mandate came to help consumers avoid the annoyance of buying a new charger every time you buy a new device. So they're trying to cut down on e-waste. So there was some logic behind this this charger switch. But yeah, people kind of celebrated when it, when it came on screen because again, you might as well just, it, it's just so much more confusing. Are you okay? Right? Are you happy about it? I'm happy. As an iPhone user? Yeah, here? like I, I don't have that crazy uh, Apple loyalty that I'm like, no, we need our own right. charger type deal even though i am an apple guy you're a, a google pixel guy and just to zoom out on on iphone how is it doing well apple is not doing so hot it posted three uh straight quarterly declines in sales but somehow the iphone is continuing to snap up market share in the u.s now it accounts for more than 50 percent of smartphones sold up from 41 percent in 2018 and it and teens love it 90 percent of u.s teens have an iphone as opposed to an android because it's this status signaling thing you, you gotta have the blue you gotta have the blue bubble or else you're just kind of less cool in in these this day and age <laughs> but if you have a green text like me you just got to <laughs> own it speaking from experience right there all right moving on uh the census bureau dropped its annual report on american poverty yesterday and it is going in the wrong direction by a lot the u.s poverty rate rose to 12.4 in 2022 from 7.8 percent the year before which is the largest annual increase on record and the numbers were even more stark for child poverty which more than doubled from a record low of 5.2 percent in 2021 up to 12.4 percent last year that equates to 5 million more american kids pushed into poverty and there's no mystery why this happened. It's about the expiration of the expanded child tax credit. Uh, just some backstory in response to COVID, the federal government widened its tax credit to send monthly checks to nearly every family with children. It's considered one of the most successful anti-poverty measures ever, cutting child poverty in half. But Congress didn't renew the program after 2021, which reversed that historic drop. And a bunch of other COVID stimulus measures have also wound down in the past year or two. So this report is significant in that it presents the first statistical evidence of how the winding down of COVID safety net programs like the child tax credit is sending poverty levels soaring. Yeah, it is crazy to see the ripple effects from, I mean, these were great during the pandemic. They were great in the years following the pandemic. And now all of a sudden, when that rug is pulled out from underneath you, a lot of economic ripple effects are happening. Another supposed bright note in the report was actually not that bright at all, which was income inequality actually fell for the first time since 2007. Again, that sounds like a good thing on, on paper, but it was actually because the middle and top income uh, parts of the ladder fell while the uh, lowest point on the ladder actually didn't rise at all. So even though the gap shrank, it was because the top was losing income rather than the bottom growing in income. So again, this is another one of those things that you see a report, you see these numbers, and then when you dig into it, sometimes they're not exactly as, as rosy as they may yeah. appear. And overall, of inflation-adjusted median household income dropped for the second straight year. It fell to 74580 in 2022. That was a 2.3% drop from uh, 2021. So maybe this, is, this data is kind of painting the portrait of why a lot of American consumers or Americans feel that the Ameri that the economy isn't necessarily going in the right direction, even though unemployment is near record lows and the job market is booming. But inflation really ate away at much of those gains. And a lot of the COVID stimulus measures that uh, that have been provided to families, including the student loan freeze, ha are, have expired in the past two years and they're going to. Uh, so a lot of but a lot of anti-poverty uh, experts looked at the, the, these child numbers and were like, this is this is really crazy. Like it is so stark how actual policy can affect millions of kids' lives and either decide whether they're in poverty or not. It is a complete policy choice. So they have been they have been advocating for continuing the, the expanded child tax credit, even though Congress sunsetted it. There might be options for states uh, and to do it at the local at the state level if uh, if the federal government decides not to pursue it. For sure. All right, Neil, let's move on to our next story. What if I told you that every time you got a stuffy nose and went to the drugstore for relief, it may not have been helping at all? Neil's face is utterly shocked right now for anyone listening, but that could be what's happening what's as an FDA advisory panel has called into question the efficacy of phenylephrine, a popular decongestant. Phenylephrine is currently in more than 260 oral, nose, and sinus medicines and has been used in over-the-counter products dating all the way back to the 1950s. 
but an FDA advisory panel declared yesterday that it probably doesn't work even at high dosages. Three large recent studies found that people who took medicines con containing phenylephrine fared no better than those who received a placebo, which is really bad news for the over-the-counter cough, sinus, and flu market, which generated about $5 billion in sales in 2021 off products that include the ingredient. Neil, the FDA doesn't have to take the panel's recommendation, but if it does, which is usually the case, it's a big deal for a lot of pharma companies. I was always skeptical of cold medicines. I got to say, my only cold medicine is a nice bowl of hot chicken soup. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. It just seemed like they never worked. And now I'm, I'm confirming it. Uh, they're confirming it. This thing has been on the market for so long. Decades. I think it was first approved in 1938. The first thing I thought about when I heard this story was, what else does not work? I know. I because know. Uh, there was this FDA review in the 1970s, and they grandfathered in so many different drugs. And now we're starting to do some peer review studies. And this one showed that this uh, this, partic this particular uh, medication just has absolutely no efficacy at all. It does not work. It does not work any better than if you did not do anything at all. Right. And I, I want to put my science hat on for a second. The reason it doesn't work is because oral phenylephrine is metabolized by the gut and liver, meaning it can't reach the bloodstream in time to actually narrow the blood vessels, which is what provides relief from stuffy noses. So basically your body is, it works too well and it processes it through the liver and the gut too quickly for it to have any, <laughs> any effect at all. So I just thought that was, that was an interesting yeah. scientific uh, so, and the nasal spray still works. It, well, they're, they're it's, it's an it, oral it, phenylephrine. Yeah, so, I'm saying, but yeah, the nasal, okay, right. if you spray it in your nose, that's fine. So what happens next is that the, all these drug companies are going to, if if this ruling does get finalized, then all of these drug companies are going to have to take these products off the shelf and reformulate them. So things like Sudafed, sinus congestion, Tylenol cold and flu severe, NyQuil severe cold and flu. These are very popular products that are just going to disappear if, if the FDA decides to say, like, we can't sell this anymore because it doesn't do anything. I think there's going to be kind of an Ozempic type uh, arms race for the cough and flu medicine because this is a massive, massive market and people are going to have to develop new formulas uh, formulas to kind of address it so i wonder if like next year and into the the following years we're going to be talking about the next like ozempic like race all right neil before we hop into the next story we're going to take a quick break ufc and wwe officially completed their merger and i promise not to use the term tag team in this story once besides that time that's it i won't the merged entity called TKO Group Holdings began trading as a public company yesterday, and it promises to be a dominant force in the entertainment industry. For anyone who forgot about this deal, back in April, Vince McMahon's wrestling giant WWE agreed to link up with mixed martial arts promotion UFC, which is owned by Endeavor, to create a 21.4 billion combat sports behemoth. UFC has more than 700 million fans worldwide, and WWE has 1.2 billion. Together, they reach viewers in 180 countries and produce more than 350 annual live events. I'm already exhausted. As we talked about on this podcast many times, live events and live sports specifically are booming right now. And both UFC and WWE have media rights deals that expire in the next year or two. When they sit down to the table with TV and streaming companies, they'll likely be able to command billions for the opportunity to show their matches to rabid fan bases. Toby, I know we constantly say we are not financial advisors, but just as a regular dude who's reading about this, this, I'm, this seems extremely bullish. Yeah, I mean, f this is just all in on the live event and all in on the live TV streaming deal. Um, because, I mean, Ari Emanuel, who is the CEO of uh, this new group, he said that TKO is ideally positioned to capitalize on the growing demand for premium sports. You can't underestimate the value of live sports in the TV ecosystem. So, I mean, we have all this talk about football, all this talk about college football, professional football, but maybe the future of live sports is in these combat sports. It is the fastest growing fan base since other than Formula One. A lot of people are coming around to the idea that combat sports yeah. is this tier one A plus live sporting event experience. Right. And what we like about it so much is the fact that it there's no season. It is all year right. round. And 
180 countries. This is such a global fan base, which a lot of advertisers are trying to get to with a bunch of other comp with which uh, with a bunch of countries kind of boosting their income levels and becoming more more avid consumers. So I mean, there's just a lot to like about what what they're doing. Plus, this boardroom, I would love to be inside it. I mean, you have Ari Emanuel, who is Ari Gold for anyone on uh, who watches Entourage. This he, this big media mogul personality. He's the CEO of the parent company Endeavor, and he's also the CEO of TKO. Then you have Dana White, who's the CEO of UFC, another larger than life personality. And then finally, Vince McMahon, uh, the you know the former CEO of WWE, is the executive chairman here. So much testosterone. It's actually ridiculous. I I would not want to be in that boardroom, but to each their own. I, I do love Ari Emanuel, though. He's just such a big live experience guy. His portfolio ranges from the Freeze Art Fair to the Professional Bull Riders League. So basically anything that brings people out to an event in person, he wants a piece of. But I also, one quick note to, to finish this segment, is that the TK, TKO stock ticker is just chef's kiss. Like, immediately entered into the pantheon of great stock tickers. So I, I love that little wrinkle of it. All right, Neil, let's move on to our next story. It's not time for the jobs report quite yet, but that didn't stop payroll service provider ADP from dropping some fire employment data this week. After analyzing the job histories of more than 1.2 million U.S. workers over the past three years, ADP found a surprising stat. 29% of people quit their jobs within a month after their first promotion. This is a statistically viable trend, too. If you compare recently promoted people to people who didn't get that title bump or their corner office, the quit rate is only 18%. So why are more people quitting after they get promoted? Well, there's lots of reason, but economists think that sometimes people feel overwhelmed and unsupported in new roles, which could lead them to seek greener pastures. On the flip side, a promotion can give someone the confidence to go seek greener pastures. So it's put employers in a bit of a tough spot where they're not sure how the heck to deal with forward-looking employees. Neil, what do you make of this trend? Well, support people who got promoted. I think it's pretty simple. The biggest thing. I think there is, I mean, at least from my own experience, when you get promoted, often it's not just you don't do often the same job. You are being, you're a contributor, you're writing a newsletter or something, just in my experience. Then when you get promoted, you're not just still writing a newsletter, you're editing, you're managing people. That is a completely different job. Uh, so the fact, so yeah, it's overwhelming. You're like, I wasn't trained to do this. So if employers don't support the, the people they promote, then after, you know, they're going to look for a new job and they do get that boost of confidence. You're like, well, I got promoted. Like maybe, maybe uh, I'll take my talents elsewhere and get paid a little bit more. Another really interesting and funny part of this trend too, is you know how LinkedIn automatically updates your feed whenever you get a new job or a new promotion? And so recruiters have literally gone on record and say, when we see that, we reach out to that yeah. person. So it's almost like LinkedIn's built-in kind of viral social feature is, is leading to and contributing to this problem. So I don't know, be careful or maybe post that if you're, if you're on LinkedIn. You might get a couple of job offers. One nugget in this I think is really important to call out is that lower skill workers were almost six times more likely to leave their job in their first month after a promotion than if they hadn't gotten the title boost. So it was so pronounced among low skill, low wage workers. And that is because there's kind of an absence of other data to go off of for employers, like a degree or certification or anything like that. So that promotion is a true signal, kind of like what you were talking about on LinkedIn, maybe that is in a higher income spectrum, but this is happening at, a, at the lower, uh, lower wage level even way more than it is happening at the higher one. Yeah, and just to zoom out real quick too, this was definitely a unique time period to be analyzing as well because, I mean, this is a period marked by a absolutely red hot job market and there was a wave of workers quitting to find newer jobs. So maybe the quit rate is edging lower too. So this could be, again, like a post-pandemic red hot labor market trend as well. So it, it, you, you always have to see how, how long this trend continues. And if you got promoted, it, this is rare. <laughs> So according to ADP's data, only 4.5% of workers were promoted within two years of being hired. So maybe employers yeah, know that. Give yourself a pat on the back if you got that promotion then. All right, our final story. Right now, the Brits are super pissed off. And when the Brits are pissed off, it can only be about one thing. 
someone is messing with their beer. And the thing that's messing with their beer is Stonegate, Britain's biggest pub chain. Stonegate decided to pull an Uber and charge surge pricing for beer that makes a pint 20 pence more expensive during the busy weekends. The company said it was adding the surcharges to cover the cost of things like extra bouncers at the door, washing glasses, and supplying plastic cups. So Brits are livid with Stonegate over the surge pricing at its pubs. The one-star Yelp reviews are just popping off. And this is my favorite thing about this story. There's a consumer advocate group for pub goers in Britain. It's called Campaign for Real Ale. And this group blasted the move and said it could undermine pricing transparency. Toby, I feel like this, this surge pricing at bars just feels misguided. I'm on board with it. And here's my here's my take. So first of all, it is truly the law of supply and demand playing out in real time. But also, this is just a fixture in so many other industries. I mean, Uber is obviously very famous for it. But dynamic pricing also happens in the airline industry around holiday periods. Ticketing companies use it. It's so common. So I don't know why people are so... Because people hate it. I know people hate it, but it is just a fixture of like how economics work basically like so this is supply and demand playing out and so i truly do think that even though people are very mad at it obviously anytime you have to pay more for your pint you're going to be mad but it's not exactly out of left field that this is happening and if you have rising costs sometimes you have to raise prices in order to cover that so yeah but this, th that's not a popular take but i'm on board with like okay but idea of surge pricing why don't you just raise i think it would be better if they just ticked up prices across the board the, the biggest thing here is transparency right people don't want to walk in and not know how much they're going to pay at any given point and so that is that's the big thing like you walk in you're like okay a beer is five dollars i know i'm going to pay that any point in the day it's a double it, – transparency is a double-sided sword, though, because one uh, exec at another big pub chain told The Guardian under the cover of anonymity that this practice has actually been going on for decades in lots of other pubs and chains. So he was actually patting Stone Stonegate Group on the back for telling people. But by telling people, they kind of raised this ruckus. So he said that it's been happening without people knowing. So it definitely is like this two two sided uh, uh, sword. It does not seem like a way to to win over customers. But the yeah. tide does seem to be turning against surge pricing. AMC tried to do this dynamic pricing in its theaters where it charged more for better seats. That test completely flopped. They they went back on that. And then Lyft is also killing uh, surge pricing as well. The CEO is just like. People hate it with a fiery passion. That's yeah. his quote. I mean, I am not going to be on the popular side of this debate for sure, but I, I did not expect myself to embrace surge pricing on this on this morning, but here we are. All right, we have to wrap it up there. Hope you all have a wacky Wednesday. Please send all thoughts about the show to Morning Brew Daily at morningbrew.com. I don't think we mispronounced anything today, so that should <laughs> cut down 99% of the emails. Let's roll the credits. Samantha Velas is our editor and producer. Evan Frolov and Raymond Liu are our associate producers. Isabel Wynn is our our technical director Billy Menino is on audio hair and makeup just got promoted so we'll see if they stick around Devin Emery is our chief content officer and our show is a production of Morning Brew great show today Neil let's run it back tomorrow